Well, week four, and what I said last week uh, about um, <laughs> all of these chapters being more or less inseparable is <laughs> even truer, if possible, this time. Uh, he is introducing a lot of concepts that he will develop further in the chapters to come. which made this really difficult to sum up. <laughs> Fortunately, he kind of provides his own summary. But before that, a bit of a review. Last week we talked about how we had the assurance that it was that Jesus' death and burial and resurrection were literal, physical, historical events. And so is our um, burial with him in baptism. And so we look back to that and we look ahead to our promised literal, physical, historical resurrection when Jesus returns. And in the middle... <laughs> We are to live as if we had already died to sin and been raised to God. So rooted in the future promise of resurrection and the likeness of Christ, we are presently in a position where we face life as if we had already been raised. But how? How are we to do that? But first he talks, the first couple, several pages of chapter four, Schaefer talks about what do we know about death and the final resurrection for Christians? And to be honest, since scripture is far more focused on how we live between the now and then, there's not a whole detailed, laid out explanation of it. But one thing Schaefer does is he uses the transfiguration as a representation of all who will be involved on that day, right? So Jesus at the transfiguration is a preview of the resurrection body. And then, of course, after his own resurrection, he was a much more vivid preview of that. But we also have Elijah and Moses. Elijah, he Schaefer takes as a preview of those who, what he called the translated ones, uh, taking that from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 51 and 52, basically. It's like, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trumpet. For the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. And of course, you know the story of Elijah. He technically never died. He's one of two Old Testament figures who are said to have been, well, the old-fashioned word is translated from this life to the presence of God without having to go through death. Enoch being the other one, right? Enoch walked with God and he was no more. Apparently he walked so closely with God that he walked straight out of this reality into the spiritual reality and never even noticed. Elijah, though, he, he made quite a flashy transition. The chariots and horses of fire and taken up in a whirlwind and all that sort of thing. So here we have, he, he uses Elijah as a preview of those who will be changed who have not gone through death, but will just suddenly be changed into the resurrection body. And then he takes the disciples as those of the New Testament, the New Covenant dead, who will be raised, and Moses as the Old Testament, Old Covenant dead to be raised. Because if you remember, it was, well, it's true that Elijah could have technically been there in his own original body, 
since he was translated into the spiritual realm, Moses was dead. And so technically, you, he, he may well have been a spirit in this conversation. But these three, should we say categories, the resurrected body, the translated, and then the dead who are to be raised, this is, Schaefer envisions this as a sort of a snapshot of that final day. He says that those who have died, and we, when we have died, are not, as so many like to think, you know, just sort of floating around as lost spirits. That's very big in um, Eastern religions, where the spirits come and they go and they linger and they maybe take on the form of insects, like a dragonfly or a butterfly or something like that, that they come to visit their relatives and then they go somewhere and no one knows where, some sort of vague other place. He says, no, in Christ, you have two options. You are either in the body and away from Christ, or you are away from the body and with Christ. There's no vague, imaginary, psychological, or merely mystical existence. He calls it a conscious and real state. And this is where he introduces one of those concepts that he's going to be developing in subsequent chapters, that of the two lines of reality, what he calls them, the seen and the unseen. But what he says about death is that, you know, as soon as you are away from the body, you are with Christ if you are in Christ. It is an immediate thing. And he bases this largely on that conversation in Luke 23 between Jesus and the thief on the cross, where he replies to the thief who says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. And there are other places where there is this assertion that immediately following upon the believer's death, they are in the presence of Christ. And you think about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where where, does Lazar where is Lazarus pictured after death? Now, you notice he doesn't speak. I have a feeling he needed a good long nap in this uh, parable, but he is there in paradise and he's being looked after by, of all people, Abraham, the great progenitor of the Jewish race. But there are concepts here that the dead are right there with Christ. Of course, then you have the other side of it <laughs> that idea of in the body and away from christ or you may want to think of it as the reality of the resurrection in the present life and he draws from the three major passages in paul's letters that talk about the resurrection uh, second corinthians Chapter 5, we made mention of this last week, but we really delve into it today. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house made not with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So, of course, here we have, you are either 
in the earthly home, <clears throat> the, the tent that is this fragile and often burdensome physical body, or we have the heavenly dwelling. And he says, so we are always of good courage. The idea of the reality of the resurrection has an effect on the present life, and that is courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There's another effect that this reality of the resurrection has on the present life. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. He talks about yeah, the love of Christ controls us, is what the ESV, I remember growing up memorizing this as compels us because we have concluded this that one has died for all therefore all have died and he died for all of those who live may no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised this is the reality of the future resurrection lived out in the present life that reality that he died and was raised for us so that we might die to this world, to self, to sin, and live for him who died for us. I don't know if we emphasize that enough. And this is how we persuade others. This is why we persuade others, because we are convinced. And I know there are some of us who may quibble. Uh, the younger you are, I think the more likely you are to quibble uh, with this. Uh, we, we would rather be away from the body at home with the Lord. I always remember thinking when I was much younger that I would be okay being with the Lord as long as I'd, you know, manage to get as much as I could out of this life first. <laughs> And I didn't think of it in those terms, but there were so many things I wanted to do. So many things I wanted to be. And so it seemed like, oh, well, not yet, Lord, not yet, Lord. I, there's too many things I want. To, and <laughs> you get more experience and you realize even the good things have their dark sides, their negatives. And that if we really believe what we say we believe, that it is actually better to be with the Lord. There is a spot. I have to look up the, the actual quote because I, I don't feel confident I could say it better than Schaefer did. But when we think about death, we think often about fear. Because it is unknown to us. But Schaefer says, the call to the Christian as he looks forward to possible death, is not to be afraid, but to realize that at the moment of death, if he has accepted Christ as Savior, he can pass into that moment today, whatever our today is. We do not need to be afraid to die. And that has the potential to be the most powerful testimony of all. Used to be that uh, a Christian family would possibly have two or three books total 
in their household because books were expensive. And one of them was a Bible and the other one was often Fox's Book of Martyrs. Because it was the example of those who had not been afraid to die for the name of Christ that called to others to believe in him. Because anybody can be so reckless as to, I laugh in the face of death, but <laughs> a thinking person, a sensible person, could never take that position. So those who really are unafraid of death, they stand out in the world. Especially when it, that is the, because of the confidence that as soon as we step across the barrier between this seen reality into the unseen reality, we are home. But Schaefer uses other passages to say, well, this is the reality of the resurrection in the present life. Of course, you can't ignore 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We've already touched on that one. That we will all be changed. But he also grabs that last verse that seems like it doesn't follow exactly from his thought, except if you are thinking in these terms, right? That after he's gone through, well, is the resurrection of the dead real? What is the resurrection body is like? What's the mystery of it all? And then he, follow, he finishes by saying, therefore, my beloved siblings, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And he says this immediately after, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Because the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is where Paul says this is... Because of all this, you can be, you must be steadfast, immovable in what you believe. When the world pushes back, you can take your stand. When fear pushes on you, you can be immovable, persisting in the work of the Lord, even when people say, oh, no, 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 that, that will cost you too much. It's too dangerous. You're putting yourself at risk. And we say, what is the risk? If I'm here, as Paul says in his other letter, it's fruitful work for God. And if I go, I'm with Christ. I win. Where's the risk? He says, your labor is not in vain. What is done for the Lord in Christ, through the Spirit, is never in vain. And then he takes 1 Thessalonians 4. Another of those passages where Paul is addressing to one of the churches the concerns they have about death. What does it mean? What does it do? How do believers face it? And of course, the whole passage is, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. And he finishes by, therefore, meaning, right, since all these things are true, encourage one another with these words. The reality of the resurrection in the present life is also mutual encouragement. Because each of us has different times and seasons in life, and some of us suffer loss, while others are growing and, and gaining. But we encourage one another with these words. We encourage those who are suffering bereavement that it's not permanent. And we encourage those who are in a we say a very profitable time of life, not to get too attached to it because that's not permanent either. This is where we are all aiming. This is where we're all heading. And so we encourage one another, whatever the season of life, with these words. You can see a glimpse here of what he's advocating for the life of the church. That the reality of the resurrection, future tense, is directly impacting our present day life and experience. But he's a practical man, is Schaefer. And he spends the rest of the chapter talking about how. How do we live presently as if already dead and raised? And one thing he says is how not to live it. And he draws a, a um, uh, a comparison between Eastern mysticism, which is all about emptying oneself and becoming fully passive and, to be honest, denying the reality of suffering as, and joy alike, because it's all an illusion. And you know what an illusion is, right? Mirage, you see something that has no physical basis in reality. And he says, this is not Christian spirituality. This is not true spirituality. I mean, he doesn't go into this, but it reminded me of that <laughs> there a little mini parable about the man who had a demon cast out from him and, and the demon went and wandered, right? He came back to his original dwelling and it had been left swept clean and empty. And so he invited some more friends of his to move in so that the state of the person was so much worse than it had been in the beginning. True spirituality is not emptiness. It is not emptying of oneself, except in that removing the demands of self makes more room for the will of God. Now, of course, if you are using this uh, 30th anniversary edition, this will make sense to you. But page 48, <laughs> if you're not using that edition, uh, I could just tell you it is not quite at the end of chapter four. It's about in the middle, roughly middle toward the end. Where he begins to talk about these two factors of reality. The factor of our being with Christ when we die. And he says the factor that at the present time, with equal certainty, if we have accepted Christ as Savior, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So no matter which of these two realities you're living in, the seen or the unseen, he has not left you alone. If you're in the unseen, of course, you're directly with Christ. And that's great. But for those of us who are still in the scene, separated away from Christ to an extent, we are not left, like he said, orphans. We have the Holy Spirit. And Schaefer goes on to say it's intriguing that God brings these two factors together. He does not expect us to think of them separately. 
When I die, it's certain that I will be with the Lord, and the Christian dead, including my loved ones, are there with him now. But at the same time, at the present moment, I have the Holy Spirit. And this is the ground upon which we build the Christian life. And he makes three points about how this is to be done. And the first one is, is that the fruitful Christian life, this true spirituality he speaks of, is not to be done simply in our own strength. A lot of times we get distracted by thinking, what can I do? <laughs> and what must I do? And people fall into, quite unintentionally often, uh, extremely legalistic practices simply by saying, well, in order to live this life, I must do this. I must not do that. And that's the focus. But it's the wrong focus. It's like when you're cooking dinner, being more focused on the tools that you're using to make the meal than how the meal itself is going to taste in the end. It, it, it gets things twisted around. Which leads to the second point. If it's not to be done simply in our own strength, how? Well, he says, see, this Holy Spirit works as the effective agent to bring into our lives the power of the crucified and glorified Christ. That's on uh, page 51, for those of you using this copy. And this is where he begins to introduce the concept of Christ as the bridegroom. This, of course, is going to be the theme of chapter 7, so he barely gets into it. But you think about this, when a man and a woman marry, it is not the woman who, who gets the man with child, it's the other way around. And as with the church and Christ, then Christ is the one who produces the fruit through the church. So it's the Holy Spirit working as the acting member you say the acting member of the Trinity in our lives, to bring us the power of Christ by which fruit is produced through us. Which, of course, then leads to a natural question. So what do we do? Are we just to sit and uh, what, what Schaefer calls just to sit in passivity and do nothing? Of course not. We are to engage in an active submission. Back to that uh, very favorite verse, uh, Rome, Romans 12, right? Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Uh, there was never a problem keeping sacrifices on the altar in the Old Testament because sacrifices were dead. Something very different with a living sacrifice. There is a song, I think it's Cadman's Call, it's talking about uh, how the uh, he, he keeps presenting himself as a living sacrifice, but he keeps crawling off the altar. And so our chief role really is to continually submit ourselves to what God wants to do in and through us. And oftentimes that means taking orders, right? And this is where the do and do not comes in. But that is more of an effect than a cause. And he takes, coming up to the end of the chapter here, uh, he takes Mary. When the angel comes to tell Mary she's going to give birth to the Messiah, Schaefer says there's just three different ways she could have responded to that. The first one being, no, thank you. Because, I mean, you think about all that it could have cost her. It probably did cost her, and definitely did cost her later in life. 
it would have been entirely humanly reasonable for her to say, uh, I appreciate the honor of the offer, but could you choose somebody else? I don't want to go through that. But she didn't. And Schaefer says, there's another thing she could have done. And I love how he puts this. He says, she could have said, I now have the promises, so I will exert my force, my character, and my energy to bring forth the promise thing. I have the promise. Now I will bring forth a child without a man. <laughs> but if you think about it, that is often how we talk about spiritual growth and working, the, the, the work we do for God. It's like, all right, I have the promises. Now I shall go forth and do in all my power. And I can't, I can't even begin to imagine how often God just is like, you can go ahead and try. <laughs> but that wasn't what I meant. But Mary's actual answer Let it be to me according to your word. And given that the virgin birth was a one-off, a one-time special event, it still provides us with a model of the kind of obedience that the Christian life demands. Not the, all right, I've got my instructions. I'm going to go take off and do this. And I will be a great success, no doubt, because I have the promise. And not, uh, of course, you know, cringing from it, shrinking back, saying, ah, you know, it sounds way too costly. But that statement that I am the Lord's servant, do with me according to your will. Possibly better known as the phrase, not my will, but yours be done, Lord. And I find it interesting <laughs> that Schaefer says here, as we come to the end of our study of the basic considerations of the Christian life, and true spirituality. And before we proceed into further considerations, these are the three points he brings into mind. The fruitful Christian life does not happen in our own strength. The Holy Spirit works in us with the power of the risen Christ to produce fruit. And our responsibility is not to be passive or to try and take control of the process, but to engage in active submission. Always, you might say, pinning ourselves down and saying, as you will, Lord, not as I will. And some of us, you say, can be very willful. So this is quite a challenge. Which is why we still have another nine chapters to work out how this actually is supposed to happen. As we get into the next chapter, uh, the, the supernatural universe, it may seem like we have gone back several steps. But he will begin, it's a really short chapter, it's not even ten pages long in this edition, but he's going back now to develop some of the thoughts that he has introduced in the opening four chapters. And this one is that idea of two lines of reality, that we have a natural side of the universe and we have a supernatural side of the universe, both being equally real and equally to be taken into consideration in terms of what they are. So that will be the assignment for next week. I'll read up on chapter five. And we will uh, we will start again on that, our further considerations.